All right, but we're live, so whenever you're ready, go ahead. I am. Hi, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for for having me. I hope you see my slides because I don't. Uh, are my slides up? Yes, it should be fine. Huh? Along oh, with okay. the camera. With yeah, just uh, yeah. All right. So uh, today we're going to talk about um, continuous software updates. And um, before we dive into the details of how do how to do it or how not to do it, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about <coughs> why. Sorry, why, why and how we update. So first, why why do we update software? Obviously, there is some software that we don't update. BC is an example. It's a command line uh, calculator and it wasn't updated for the last 20 years and it wasn't updated for the last 20 years for again very good reason. The command line, the bash didn't change and uh, the, um, uh, the, the basic rules of uh, math didn't change. So there is nothing to update, but that's not usually the case. Usually, when we have software that have users, those users want updates. They want new features and they want new features as soon as possible. Yesterday, now there is a really hard push to deliver changes as as frequently as possible. You can think your of your mobile phone as an example. Back in the 90s, if you had your Nokia or Motorola without snake game you didn't have it and there there was no way to get it instead of replacing your phone the data cable that existed didn't really help because you couldn't install new software or update existing software with it you could only download your contacts and then obviously everything changed 2007 actually with the introduction introduction of iphone and then smartphones took over our life and brought the concept of software update to our life and now it's so um, natural for us, we don't even think about it. We just take out our new phone and boom, there is new versions of new apps all the time because we, the users, insist on it. We ask for it, we require that. Um, another very, <clears throat> very important reason for software updates is security. As software takes over our lives and we do more and more with software, the security vulnerabilities become more and more threat. And you can think about battling security vulnerabilities and as you thought about stopping distances when you were in driving school and get your driving license. There are two aspects for stopping distance, the thinking distance and the breaking distance. They're very different. Thinking distance is how fast we react. It's about the human brain. Breaking distance is about how fast the car comes to full stop, and that's about the braking pads, the wheels, the, the road, etc., etc. So complete, two completely different concepts with completely different ways to overcome it. Better alloys for the pad, better roads, better wheels uh, for the braking distance and for thinking distance, autopilot, emergency stop, etc. Instead, but those are very different concepts. Both necessary. The same with security vulnerabilities. You have three steps. Identify that you have been breached, fix whatever it takes. Usually 90% of the time it will be a updating a dependency. Either it's your operating system and you need to install security patch or replace the operating system altogether, or it is your vulnerability in your code a dependency and then you need to update your dependency descriptor, um, uh, your uh, NuGet files, your colon files, whatever you work with, and then you need to uh, and then you need to deploy the code as fast as possible to production. And this, the deploy phase, this is where faster updates come into play. The faster you can deploy your code to production, the fixed code, the more secure you are. And to, to demonstrate, to give you a couple of examples of how critical it is. UK hospital system was shut down three years ago because of ransomware. The problem was dependency. Oh, sorry, the problem was dependency. They didn't update the operating system from Windows XP. There was no patches for security vulnerabilities. They didn't update the dependency. They were hacked. 
once they decided to update, it took them very long time to update because it's an important and heavy, massive dependency to update, and obviously they suffered. Another example, Equifax. Um, almost 200 million or more than 200 million uh, um, credit records were stolen from a credit agency, Equifax, three years ago. Again, dependency. They had an old version of Struts. It's a Java web framework that wasn't updated and allowed remote code execution. So everything was stolen and it took them two months to update the dependency and deploy it to production. So again, deploy as fast as possible, you will be more secured. The problem getting worse with modern vulnerability types like Spectre and Meltdown, and it's getting worse because Spectre, especially Spectre, is impossible to prevent. You only discover that you have vulnerability once you are already attacked. So with this kind of attack, you all you have to do is act after the fact, zero day by definition. It means that here you have to act as fast as possible, including again the deploy phase, which is about software updates. Now, the good news are the industry already is pretty advanced in this regard. If we look at the state of DevOps report, the most important report in the DevOps world, you can see here that it serves more than 30,000 uh, um, uh, responses and uh, it, it does it very scientifically, very, uh, very reliable data. And you can see that 20, that they um, organized, they, they gave these responses and they, they organized it in cohorts. So you can see here from low performers to elite performers and elite performers are already 20% of the market. Every fifth organization are elite performers and the elite performers know how to update the software fast. They deploy multiple deploys per day. They know how to get code to production as fast as possible. And this is the case because it's not a good idea and not a new idea. We go back all the way to extreme programming, 1998, more than 20 years ago, XP back then, uh, extreme programming advocated for short feedback. And since then, every new methodology is about shorter feedback, shorter feedback, release faster, release faster, scrum, reduce cycle uh, time, uh, Toyota protection system or lean manufacturing as it known, decide as late as possible, deliver as fast as possible, Kanban, increment change, and obviously um, DevOps. All those methodologies are about delivering faster. Hello, my name is Baruch Sadogurski. I'm the chief sticker officer at JeffRog. If this event were live, I would be there with you in wonderful Rome that I personally love so much and would give you some stickers to thank you for being with me. No stickers, so I'm chief of developer advocacy with JFrog. The most important part on this slide is my Twitter handle, SJ Baruch. It's also on the bottom of every slide if you forget about it. The most important slide of today is this. You go to jeffrog.com slash show notes and you will see there the slides are already there. The video I will upload as soon as it got published. All the links, including the um, um, security uh, breaches that I mentioned earlier and uh, much more important, the state of the report, all the links and everything I will be talking about, all the links are already there. A place to comment, to rate, and a very nice raffle. If I'm not in error, those are JFROG t-shirts, which are absolutely amazing. So you can participate in the raffle as well when you go to the uh, to the show notes. So with that, let's get to work. Let's say I convinced you that you want to con to uh, update faster, and let's see what happens next. I will give an example of Java. I uh, used to be a, a Java engineer back in the day. So once Java engineer, always Java engineer. Three years ago, Mark Reynolds, the head of platform for Java, one of the two most important um, people in Java world, decided that Java will release faster. Three years ago, they decided they're going to release every six months instead of every year and a half or two years or de facto four years. So every half a year, there is new version of Java since uh, September 2017. 
Java 8 was the version back then. So we have Java 8, Java 9, Java 10, Java 11, Java uh, 12, Java 13, and Java 14. Seven Java versions was released, were released since this blog post was published, seven. And then you look at the real world. This is a report by Ben Evans uh, from New Relic, they instrument JVMs for um, monitoring, so they know exactly which version of Java runs on each and every JVM of their customers, which is majority of the industry. They are very big. And you can see more than 80%, more than 80% didn't move past Java 8, the same Java 8 that was out three years ago and seven versions since then. And then you go like, what? It doesn't make any sense because we just were convinced that it's important to update faster and we are interested in getting the latest updates and getting to the latest Java. So what happened? To understand what happened, we need to understand how we update, how we take the decisions about updating. So here is a nice example for you. Update is available. We decide if we want it. Sometimes we don't want it. It was like Java 9. There is nothing interesting in, then we just want to update. But let's say there are interesting features. And then the next question is, are they high risks? If we're talking about software where there is no high risks or environments where there is no high risk, sure, we'll try. I on my machine run every Java version exists because why not? It's a low risk. I don't do I don't run anything in production. It's just my machine. I definitely want to try every possible version. But obviously, my production servers are high risk. The next question is, do we trust the update not to break anything? This is obviously not the case with major versions of Java. They are going to break things, and that's the problem. If we do trust, then we're just going to update. If we don't, let's ask ourselves why. The first question is, the first answer is, well, they don't do enough QA. They do not test well enough, and this is why uh, we cannot trust them. Well, this is silly because obviously companies know how to do QA those days. So this is not the real answer. The real answer is complexity. We in JFrog manage binaries. We do artifact management and uh, release management and uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery with artifacts. We know about artifacts. We see this complexity in our world as well. Agile, bring the concept of continuous integration. Continuous integration means every build counts. We need to take, start to take care of the binaries. Continuous delivery means each and every one of them now is a possible uh, candidate for 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 uh, being in production, we need to be able to measure to manage them. Infrastructure is code. Now hardware is also software artifacts. We manage. We need to manage them as well. Microservices. Now we have tons of small uh, artifacts that interconnected and need to be managed together. Docker. Every line in their deployment descriptor in 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 their sorry in their build descriptor in Docker file generates. And a, a binary of its own, and every change that generates binary of its own. Serverless. Every three lines of JavaScript code is now an artifact that needs to be managed. And IoT, this is like complexity through the roof. My light bulb here probably runs a Kubernetes cluster and it's all um, and it's all a disaster. So the answer is it's complex. This is why we don't trust. Now, OK, we know that it's complex and we know that we don't trust. The next question is, can we verify the update? And can we verify the update? Sometimes just no, I won't even bother. So for example, with Java, if uh, verifying your production, the, 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 nothing broken in production takes half a year and you have a new release of Java half a year, you will just go like, well, I don't even bother. I will skip a couple of versions because I don't have time to verify. Even if the answer is yes, you will end up with time consuming verification. And that brings the opposite pressure on the vendors. So we spoke about the pressure of releasing faster, and now we have the opposite pressure of putting more food on the table. We want to make our updates appealing enough so our users will invest in uh, time consuming uh, verification because our users now have 
a, a trade-off. Features that we really want versus acceptance test cost. Since we spoke that acceptance test costs are very, uh, uh, very high, vendors will try to add more and more features to each and every update to tip the scale. But the problem is that the more bulky the updates, the higher the acceptance costs. It's a spiral that only gets worse. Let's see if we can break this spiral somehow. How can we do it? For example, update is available. Do we want it? It doesn't matter because now it's auto updated. It's only good for the use cases where there are no high risks. And there are, here are some examples, your browser. Most of you probably have no idea what version of browser do you run because, <laughs> sorry, Chrome and Firefox do a very, very good job of hiding this information from you so they can update whenever they like. It's not a very high risk. Worst case, if Chrome uh, release some bug, you will just use Firefox for a day. No one will die. Twitter in your browser, actually any web app hides the version or the update process. You have no idea. But again, if your favorite website is down for a day, you'll go to another one. Twitter on your smartphone, same here. It's auto updated for the majority of us. And worst case, if Netflix on your phone doesn't work, you're going to watch um, uh, uh, Hulu for a day. Your operating, <coughs> your operating system, ah, that's another story. Here, the system will ask you multiple times if you want to update because the risks are high. So this um, works, this cheat works only for low risks. Now let's talk about why. Let's talk about how we got to the situation when we don't trust our vendors and how we can fix it. I will start with a personal story. Google on Hub was the two generations uh, previous uh, router from Google. Now we have uh, Google Nest Wi-Fi. Before we had Google Wi-Fi and Google on Hub was before that. One of the things very rare back then, didn't exist in any other, was what they call a self-improving system. What does it mean a self-improving system? It basically means over there updates. Instead of um, going through a very painful process of firmware, manual firmware update for your router, Google on Hub promised over there updates. That was one of the reasons I was one of the first to buy, to buy it, and I was very happy with it. It's a great router. Now, three years ago in um, February 2017, um, I was on a business trip and uh, my wife calls me and she's like, Baruch, the kids are sitting in the dark. And I'm like, why? And she's like, they go like, Alexa, turn on the light, Alexa, turn on the lights, and nothing happens. And I'm like, what happened? Uh, the, the power is down? No, the internet is down. So this day, the kids learned that there are physical switches on the wall, and we got the following email from Google. Well, sorry, folks, we accidentally, with the latest update, reset your router to factory settings. And once we re reset it to factory settings, we don't have any way to fix it because now it's in, not connected to the network. So can you please reconfigure it manually? Well, this might work for a router because we are nearby and we can reconfigure it, but think about other environments. Think about um, a solar uh, panels in uh, Sahara Desert. It takes three days to get there in helicopter and then three more days on camels. And by the time you got there, you have a week of production loss, huge monetary losses. Instead, you can implement a local, local rollback. You can have a previous version saved on the device. And then if something goes wrong, you roll back to the previous version. Now, the funny thing is we know this concept very well, each and every one of us, back from Windows 95. You remember this picture? When you change the graphic cards on your computer or the monitor that your computer is plugged into and change the resolution, this is what you saw. This is a local rollback. In case that changing the resolution, the update, went catastrophically bad and you cannot see anything on your screen, it will revert automatically to the previous settings that actually worked. That's exactly what local rollback is. 
Why we don't use it in uh, uh, more today? That's a good question. Now you can say, well, this is IoT, this is routers, I'm not in, really interested, I'm not, in, I'm not an IoT developer, but the T in IoT stands for everybody. It stands for any device, including your uh, servers that you are working on as a backend developer. So let's take another example of this T, and that will be cars. Let's talk about so updating software in cars. What can possibly uh, go wrong? So one of the examples is Jaguar I-Pace. Jaguar I-Pace is a great car released only last year, 2019, and six months after it was released, they have to do a rollback, a call, a recall because they have a bug, software bug in the brakes system. Well, software bug in the brake system, it's pretty important and you want to fix it as soon as possible. The problem is they had no way to fix it instead of doing a recall, instead in, 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 uh, just bringing the cars to the services to update software. This is just wrong because it's very, very costly and there is no way to force a recall. How do you force a recall? You send an, an, a mail in red envelope with caps, letters, recall, security issue, and all this stuff. But in the end of the day, if people won't go, they won't go. Instead, if you implement an over-the-air software update for your car, you can push the software, the update, very cheaply, and you can actually force everybody to use it. So software updates are great. The only thing that is better than software updates are continuous software updates. And to illustrate the concept of continuous software updates, I will give you another example. Now, this is Tesla, amazing car, does over their software updates. And here is one issue that uh, actually exists. It's called phantom braking. Phantom braking is when you drive an autopilot and there is no not, nothing on the road that blocks you, but car still stumbles on the blocks. On, on the brakes. This is very annoying. It's annoying for the driver. It's annoying for the family. The biggest problem, they will never believe that car actually did it and start to blame you, which is even more annoying. Now, there was a rumor that the fix for phantom braking is coming. And the Tesla owners are waiting for this fix and they're waiting and waiting and waiting and it doesn't come. When it came, it turns out that all those people were waiting for chess the game chess to be released because Tesla has games and they're waiting for chess. Now, and here is the uh, fix for phantom braking. Now, this is very annoying for the people who use the autopilot and don't play, uh, play chess, why they waited so long for this fix to be released. But you know what? Maybe it's the other way around. Maybe the chess was ready and they waited for the fix for phantom braking before the release. Now, it's not better in any way because there are some people who like chess and don't use autopilot. For them, it was frustrating as well. They wanted to get the game, the, the, the chess game faster, but instead they waited for a feature they didn't ask. No matter how you spin it and no matter how you define important, what's important as a feature, Bulk updates force important features wait for not important features. And this is bad. So instead, what you can do, you can release as soon as possible and implement continuous updates. Think about it. We get the fix first as an update and then a chess as an update, or the other way around, the chess as an update and then a fix as an update. Win-win. Everybody win with continuous updates. Now, you can say, okay, okay, this is all um, IoT, um, this is all automotive, it has nothing to do with me. Well, you're wrong, because those folks really suffer because their environment is harsher than yours. They don't, ha they don't control the availability of the target. We don't know if the car is online. They don't control the state of the target. We don't know if it's driving or parked or, 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 or anything else, if there are people inside or not. We not always control the version of the target because we, uh, the, 
during the previous update, our target was offline, so we didn't get the previous version, and now it's two versions behind, and we don't control that. And even the access for the target, right? If something went wrong, we can go to our data center, or we can log into our machine, or we can call the support of our cloud provider and make them go to the machine physically. If we update a device somewhere in the world, we don't have access. So our life is much easier and still we manage to screw royally. This is one of my favorite examples. It's from 2012, it's eight years, but it's so great that I keep bringing it. The, um, Knight Capital was a trading firm on New York Stock Exchange, electronic trading. And they decided they are going to update their system. They didn't update for many years, for like eight years. So what did they do? They decided they will reuse some old APIs, they will reuse some flags, and those flags now in the new system will mean something completely different. Buy instead of sell, something like that. Absolutely different meaning. And then they forgot to update one of the servers. And now new clients sent commands that meant something completely different to the old code. And obviously they started to bleed money like crazy, like um, very significant amounts of money every second. And then what they did, well, they rolled back the update. This is like the natural reaction. Oh, something went wrong, let's just roll back everything. And now all the new clients sent incorrect uh, instructions to the old code and they started losing million dollars a minute. After four, uh, sorry, 10 million dollars a minute. After 40 minutes, after $400 million in losses, they managed to find the problem because they have no monitoring, no alerting, no debugging, but it was too late. They went out of business. This is how security update that went wrong took one of the biggest trading firms in New York Stock Exchange out of business. There are a lot of mistakes and a lot of things to learn. First of all, automated deployment. People suck at repetitive tasks. People forget to update one of the eight servers. Machines never forget to update one of the eight servers. So repetitive tasks should be done by machines via automating. Another one, frequent update. If it hurts, do it more. They didn't update for many years. Probably the people who knew how to update the system weren't even there anymore and everybody else were super stressed and super panicking than the first time they did it. If it hurts, do it more, update frequently, and then it won't be as scary anymore. State awareness, they obviously um, updated uh, the state, uh, they used the state, and it's dangerous. You need to remember what you are doing, and especially if you have to roll back, what happens there? So this is that. Another example from modern, from uh, last year, again, half a year ago, almost a year ago, Cloudflare. If you remember, it was like a huge deal. M tons of sites went down for 30 minutes because something Cloudflare, which is their um, DNS server, um, uh, died. What happened is that Cloudflare deploys new uh, rules to battle attacks, and they deployed one misconfigured rule. It was actually a regex, as usual, that spun out the CPU to 100%, and then the error propagated in their data center, and next thing you know, their status page mentioned affected region Earth. Well, very true. Everything was down for half an hour. Again, a lot of learn here. First of all, progressive delivery, releasing the bug to affect all the users. Instead, you release to a small number of users first, effectively reducing the blast radius who actually suffered. And then you observe through observability. If a problem occurs, you stop the release, you revert the update of the affected users. The thing is, we know that from our childhood when our parents teach us how to do laundry. Remember, all the dead have this always spot test on a hidden service first. This is progressive delivery. We try on some part and then we see if it's good. If it's good, we do it for the, your entire shirt. If not, you don't use it anymore. This is progressive delivery. 
Progressive delivery always comes with observability. You need to know that something went wrong and you cannot rely on angry comments on Twitter. You actually need people to tell you that something went wrong and you do it with observability and it's three pillars, tracing, monitoring and logging. Ideally, it will revert the progressive delivery automatically, but in any case, you need to see it first in order to know what to do. And um, then your rollback, obviously, fixes might take time, users suffer in the meanwhile, you need to implement rollback to uh, 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 roll to the previous version and not wait for a new version. Sometimes rollback platforms, uh, rollback is unavailable, for example, mobile platforms, both Apple Store and uh, Android uh, Play Store and Google Play Store do not know how to do rollbacks. If you want to go to a previous version, you need to rename it, resubmit it for testing and for verification. It will take days and only then you will be able to release it. So the way to go around it is implement feature flags and that's a change the functionality on the fly using REST API. If you introduce new functionality that misbehaves, you need to be able to disable it from API without deploying a new artifact. And the last example of the day is MoviePass. MoviePass is a subscription service for going to the movies, and it went down for weeks to update their app. And this is obviously horrible because by the time you will come back from being down five weeks, you won't have any users. That's exactly what happened to MoviePass. They actually went out of business because of that. Instead, zero downtime, small over there updates is the way to go. So to summarize, continuous updates are frequent, are automatic, are well-tested, progressively delivered, so you can roll back, stay aware, observable, and can implement local, local rollbacks. That's an extra credit task. Not everybody needs it, but you need it, you'd better do it. So to summarize how it looks, we have update available. Do we want it? Yes or no, it's auto-updated. And obviously it works for the low, um, low risks, but even for high risks, once we establish continuous updates as a standard and people expect it from us and we do it well, the trust is back and it will actually work for high risk updates as well. So our goal is to transition from bulk and rare questions uh, and bulk and rare software updates to extremely tiny and extremely frequent soft, uh, software updates, so tiny and so frequent that they provide an illusion of software flowing from the development to the update task. We call it the liquid software vision and actually two co-founders of JFrog, Fred Simon and Yoav Landman and yours truly, we wrote a book about it calling the liquid software. It's the concept that now you're familiar with and details of implementation of how to do it in different scenarios, all in this book. And I want to give this book to you, uh, uh, dear viewers. If you um, contact me on Twitter, at jbaruch, as you can see here on the bottom of every slide, in, in the direct messages, I will send a book to you for thanking you to be here. Now you might think, are there corner cases? Are there situations when continuous updates is not the way to go? Let's say there is a surgery going on and we want to update the, the, the machines that do the surgery during the surgery. Probably not a very good idea. Another example is, well, uh, you want to update your plane miss flight. Do you think it's a good idea to update your plane miss flight? Probably not. But let me convince you in the remaining two minutes that it is a good idea. So if you didn't know, Airbus 350 has a memory leak. It has to be restarted every 115 hours. Otherwise, trouble. And it's not only Airbus uh, 350, it's also Boeing 787. This one has to be restarted every 51 day because it has a register leak. So again, there are bugs, significant bugs, critical bugs in production of two of extremely popular airplanes. And now think about it when you fly on one of them, let's take the Airbus, 
and you are over Pacific and you fly from LA to Tokyo and then, you know, there is no land in a three hours flight. And then the pilot asked the co-pilot, did we restart? And the co-pilot, no, I think we didn't. And then the pilot, well, our 150 hours, it's almost up. Now, what do we do? Would it be nice to be able to actually fix the memory leak to prevent this plane from going down? Now, some of you, I bet, will agree with me that it is a good idea to do continuous, uh, continuous updates if they are tested well enough on the plane during the flight. And it's already been done. Planes are being patched mid-flight. Here's an example from Boeing 777, and that's kind of uh, 20 years ago or even more, 30 years ago that they did it. Uh, 777 was the first plane with software system to battle the shakings of uh, turbulence. And it didn't work well. So what they did is they put all the engineers on the plane, took off, went to the area of turbulence, debug mid-flight, fixed mid-flight, deployed the patch, deployed the software update, and then tested that it works, everything mid-flight. So it's not unheard of, and it's a good idea. Software updates, liquid software, should be implemented in most of the industry, even if those that you might think it's not a very good idea. So with that, um, questions time and some Twitter ads. So as I mentioned, Ed J. Baruch on Twitter, liquid software is the hashtag of the book. When you uh, talk about it and want to ask questions, use it. Azure Day Rome, this is where we are. So if you talk about this session, please mention our organizers and hosts as well. And liquidsoftware.com, this is where you find more information about the book. Don't forget jeffrey.com slash show notes. Uh, what you get there is the slides, all the links, raffle of the jfrog t-shirts amazing jfrog t-shirts don't forget and one more thing again to thank you all for being here jfrog has its own user conference the jfrog swamp up coming up july 1st july 1st it's like in two weeks and it will be full of great content that uh, great speakers and great sessions that i really really um uh, suggest you you will you will come in here and again for the viewers of this session for you folks it's completely free when you speak with me about the book mention that you want to come to swamp up i will give you a free pass for this conference not only that by coming to the conference we will donate jeff will donate 20 bucks to charity again because we think to, we want to thank you for being there so with that now it will be a good time if you have any questions we have three more minutes so hit me up um, in the um, in the Q and A uh, window, I think. Uh, yep, there you go. Q and A. No open questions. Let's change it. Go ahead and uh, give me some questions. Oh, here is a question from Valerio. 
we have a problem in distribution. We have to deploy some customers, some custom data, I guess, to center customer. Any advice? Thank you for 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 this question. And yes, distribution it's a it's a it's a big and 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 good question because you might want ah some DLLs. Okay, some DLLs to center to center customers. Yes, because um, when you have flavors of different uh, different data um, it's again a question of how do you know what should go there and uh, this is done um, uh, this shouldn't be in any way obstacle to doing continuous updates because in the end of the day it's just the selection of right distribution uh, bundles and there are tools to solve it and the shameless plug jfrog have one of them so if you uh, go to jfrog.com and look at our jfrog distribution tool it's exactly that it knows how to create the right bundles and then how to distribute the right bundles to the right uh, edges, the right customers, the right servers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is solved with tools. Um, it it cannot be an excuse for not uh, for not doing continuous updates. And again, in the book, we go a little bit about distribution as well, so you can find some answers there. But uh, yeah, distribution. Uh, is something important to pay attention to, but not something that cannot be done. And I think we're out of time, so I want to thank you all again for, for coming. You know where to find me on Twitter, and uh, let's keep chatting there. Yes, we are um, a minute late, so I believe uh, if we have some more questions, uh, we have some space for that. No, I guess not. All right, so we're done. Yep, thank you very much. Thank you for having me and have a great day. Was our pleasure. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, we'll see you on, on Twitter. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.